In this video, uh, we are going to learn how you can design your own chip and possibly how you can manufacture this your chip for free. I'm creating this video also for everyone who is just generally interested uh, to know how this process works, how, how to design a chip and how to manufacture it. And that's exactly my case. Uh, I'm not planning to design my own chip uh, right now, but uh, I can see that more and more companies are talking about custom chips. So I just wanted to know how it works. And because I'm not expert for this topic, what I did, I called Matt and uh, we recorded this call and that's basically what you will see in this video. Before I play uh, my call with Matt, uh, I would like to explain some words what Matt is going to use. Uh, because uh, understanding these words uh, will help you to understand better what Matt is going to talk about. This, what you can see here, this is basically the whole process what we are going to talk about. And you don't need to read it uh, right now, okay? We will go through everything step by step. The first thing is a Verilog file. If you search for Verilog, you will find that it is a hardware description language. So basically in this file, you describe your chip. And in our case, uh, in our example, we will use a very simple chip. We will uh, design a chip with uh, one inverter. And this is how uh, the uh, our chip looks when we use the Verilog language to describe our very simple chip. If uh, you are not designing digital chip, for example, if you are designing an analog chip, then uh, you don't need to use Verilog file, you can just draw everything by hand. But the Verilog files can be very useful when you are designing digital chips. It's similar to programming FPGA. Uh, next, uh, these are some words what uh, I had to really search a lot about to understand what they mean. The first one is open lane. When we have a look, what does it mean? Open Lane is an automated RTL to GDS uh, flow based on several components uh, and uh, basically it's a software which will translate this Verilog file into GDS and GDS, uh, these, are the, these are kind of Gerber files for uh, silicon. So uh, uh, the uh, chip manufacturer will need from you these GDS files to be able to manufacture your chip. Uh, next word is Skywater Open Source PDK. When we search for this, the Skywater Open Source PDK is, an collaboration, is a collaboration between Google and Skywater uh, company to provide a fully open source process design kit and related resources, which can be used to uh, manufacture your designs in Skywater company. So basically, uh, Skywater open source PDK are some uh, guidelines, rules, and recommendations, which when you follow this, when you are designing your chip, then uh, you are sure that you can manufacture your chip in Skywater company. If you have a closer look at these recommendations, this is how it looks, okay? Uh, design rules, and here are some layer definitions and minimum critical dimensions, and this is what you will find there. And uh, here in this note, uh, you can see there are not only the rules, but in Skywater open source PDK, you can also find libraries. So basically, you don't have to design everything from scratch. 
if you use in your chip an inverter, you don't have to draw the transistors and everything in the invent, invent, inventor. Uh, inverter. <laughs> but you can use uh, a uh, inverter which is in a library. And uh, that makes everything much more simple. Then there is also this Sky 130 process node word, which is cheap manufacturing technology. If we go back, here you can find more information about the uh, Sky uh, 130. And it's here. The Sky 130 is a major hybrid technology originally developed by Cypress Semiconductor uh, and uh, it describes all these kind of things. Okay, so uh, these are the words what you need to understand. Open Lane, GDS, PDK, Sky 130. Next, uh, we would like to learn a little bit more about eFabless. Uh, it's basically a company which is manufacturing custom chips. When you search for eFabless, uh, this is what you will find. And uh, what I found very interesting are these numbers here. Uh, basically here you can see if you would like to manufacture your own chip, then it may cost you like 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars to manufacture it. Unless you use the Open MPV shuttle program, then Google will pay for manufacturing your own chip. So when you search for Open MPW shuttle program, uh, this is what you will find. Okay, MPW it means uh, multi project buffer. So uh, basically they place the uh, chips from different companies or different projects on one buffer and uh, that's what makes it cheaper to manufacture your chip. And this uh, open MPW shuttle program, uh, because it is sponsored by Google, basically Google pays for manufacturing these uh, chips. If you would like to uh, use or if you would like to be part of this project then uh, I think you can sign up down here. Uh, the next word what is here is Caravel Harness SOC. It is a chip template. Again when you search for uh, Caravel this is what you will find. The AFABLES Caravel chip is a ready-to-use test harness for creating designs with the Google Skywater 130 nanometer open PDK. So basically, this uh, Caravel chip will help you to uh, debug your chip and access your chip. Uh, basically, there is a microcontroller. This is how it looks, okay? So there is a microcontroller on the Caravel harness SOC. And there is the area where uh, your uh, design, your chip design is going to be placed. When you have a look on the silicon, this is the silicon of the Caravel harness SOC. Down here you can see the microcontroller. And this is the area where you can place your own project, your own chip. Here you can see uh, some small projects. And then uh, you can connect uh, your uh, chip with this microcontroller. It will help you to debug your chip. And also you can uh, connect your chip to these uh, GPIOs, which are then accessible on this standard footprint of the Caravel Harness SOC. Okay, so this is how the chip looks when it is basically finished. This is how you then solder it down. And uh, the, uh, you, you can get then also the uh, board which you can connect to PC and then use it for debugging your chip. 
And as I explained, uh, or as we already, um, as you already maybe noticed, Skywater Technology is the company which is uh, manufacturing the chips. So it is semiconductor fabrication plant. These are all the words what you need to know to watch the call. Very quickly, I would like to explain what we can see down here on these pictures. So, this is the chip what we are going to design in this video. And part of this chip are some standard components which are specified in PDK libraries. Our chip was generated from this Verilog file where we specified what uh, we would like to have on our chip and where we specified the behavior of our chip. And uh, OpenLane software took this Verilog file and OpenLane automatically generated the design of our chip. If you would like to manufacture your chip through Open MPW Shuttle program, then you would need to take it, place it into this empty area of Caravel Harness SOC, then you would connect the input and output pins of your chip, uh, for example, to the GPIOs or to the microcontroller, which is already on Caravel Harness SOC. And uh, then your Caravel Harness SOC would become one of the 40 different projects which are uh, uh, part of the Open MPW shuttle program. So basically Google is paying for uh, manufacturing 40 different Caravel Harness SOCs. These 40 uh, Caravel Harness SOCs are going to be manufactured in Skywater company and if I understood right you will get like 50 chips and uh, you will get also some uh, some boards which you can use to debug access and control your chips of course uh, you will not get 50 boards I think Matt mentioned you will get like three boards uh, for debugging uh, if I understood right, uh, this uh, very first uh, manufacturing through Open MPW shuttle program, it has not been completed yet. So I think uh, I forgot to ask, but I think Matt is still expecting his uh, chips. Okay, we know all the information, what we need to know to watch the recorded call. And... Um, Matt is going to start with uh, creating this inverter. So here it is. Here is the recording from my call with Matt. So what okay. do you need to do to design your own chip? So how simple do you want? Do you want like the most simple simple or do you want like the next step up simple? Uh, it can be the most simple simple. Okay. Um, what is included so in the most simple simple? Uh, uh, an inverter, like okay. the most basic digital circuit. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. So this is an example of hardware description language. Um, so I make like a little block with the module and I call it a name. And then it's, I'm defining it to have two ports, an input and an output port. And then I just say that the output should be assigned to not of the input. Okay, so uh, this is the first step, basically. You yeah. So you write, you write your, you describe the hardware. So one thing that's confusing about Verilog is it looks a bit like C, and people often think, especially computer programmers, people with programming experience, they come to Verilog and they write as if it's a sequential C program, but you're actually designing hardware. So if I take this and I copy it 10 times, say, then I haven't, the, those inverters aren't being made one after the other. What I've just said is I want 10 inverters 
and I will get 10 inverters all working together in parallel. But for us, we're just going to take this super simple design and just say we only want one inverter. Okay, so the first step, you describe your uh, chip in the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the code. Then? Yeah, for digital chips, yeah, which is the kind of the easiest way to get started, I would say. Um, and then at the moment, I'm inside a directory called OpenLane, and OpenLane is the name of the ASIC tool flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and um, I have a config file here that sets up um, everything that I need f to get the um, to drop that uh, harder description language into the open lane flow, and then at the output, I'm going to get my GDS two files that I send to the factory or I put inside the Caravel. Okay, so but from this you will get like the block which you will then place somewhere or yes, how your yeah. block is going to be connected to the rest of the chip. Yeah, so I start the tool up which is run in a docker mm -hmm. and then I say I want you to run on my um, inverter um, program, my harder description language and this prints out a ton of logic, a ton of... Um, uh, logging and but one of the things we can see here is that the synthesizer has read our hardware description language and realized it needs one cell to realize this design and that cell is a not gate mm -hmm. um, and then if I go down a bit further I can see um, it get tran it gets translated into a specific standard cell mm -hmm. so um, we haven't really talked about standard cells, but as part of the process design kit from Skywater. So this is one of the other things that has made things more accessible, is that before last year you would have had to have signed an NDA to get a process design kit. But now we've got an open source one. And one of the things inside the process design kit is the standard cells. And that's like a kit of 150 components, not gates, uh, AND gates, OR gates, flip-flops, everything that you need to build digital logic. And then Open Lane knows all those blocks and it's saying, okay, well, to realize a NOT um, gate described in the harder description language, I'm going to use this particular inverter. And it's got like a choice of 10 and it's chosen this one. Wow, that's like super clever. So... Uh, yeah. Okay, and what is output from this? Well, we keep on going down um, and it does like a whole set of different processes. Um, so maybe I'll just show you a slide so you can see how this um, progresses through. So um, this is the open lane flow. So we've mm -hmm. our inverter mm -hmm. that we described is a is the, the um, harder description language and it comes in here as a dot v dot verilog file. Um, and we've just seen synthesis. Um, and that is what has kind of read the design and worked out that it needs a not gate. Mm -hmm. And then we're running through this flow here. And then at the end, we get out our GDS files. So kind of, I'm going to skip over here. But the next thing that is going to do is it's going to work out how much space it needs. So this is kind of floor planning, placement, and then connecting it up, routing. So that gets back to your question about how the vias happen. So let's take a look at the intermediate files in this process. So we've seen that we need one inverter, and mm -hmm. then the next thing is the floor plan. So let's run make k layout floor plan. See if this works. Okay, great. So this is kind of, um, we've got a small area here, 34 microns by 55 microns, and we've got an input and an output port if I turn on the texts, there we go, we can see the in and the out. Mm -hmm. And then um, here we've got like a, a, a row of decoupling capacitors. So they, you kind of, you get a, a set of decoupling capacitors on the left and the right side of your grid. So and this is basically, also, this is our design now, yeah? The, the, yes, this is the beginning, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this is our cell. This is the cell what we are creating. This is the inverter where we... Yes, this is going to be... When this is finished, this will be the inverter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is on the way. So this is the floor plan. 
And then the next thing we're going to look at is placement. So mm -hmm. that's going to place the inverter standard cell in there somewhere. So uh, I'll quit this and then I say um, replace, um, make K layout replace. So these are just like, this make file is just like shortcuts to load the correct files from the correct places mm -hmm. and of the in the in the parts of the flow that I'm think are interesting to show. Mm -hmm. um, so do you need to run the floor plan before you do the the place? It all gets done for you automatically. So when I I started that flow off and then it finished, all, all of this has already been done, mm -hmm. and now we're just kind of looking at the intermediate files Individual along the way steps. to it being ah, okay. done. Yeah. So this is now um, in placement, okay. but it's, it's also done, we also jumped ahead a bit because we've got the power grid now. So mm -hmm. this vertical and horizontal stripes are where the power gets connected. And these are vias. And then this is our inverter cell here. And everything was done automatically. Yeah, everything's done automatically. At the moment, this inverter is not going to work because it's not wired up to anything. It's not in the right place. It's just kind of roughly in the right place. Um, and if we had like a lot more um, cells, they would kind of be like grouped. If some were related more to the input, they would be like closer to the input. If mm -hmm. they were more related to the output, they'd be closer to the output. So they're kind of like just dumped around. But then the next set is like a detailed placement. So everything gets snapped to the grid, uh, which I think is, um, is really cool because it helps you to see um, how um, everything works kind of mod modularly. So if I just turn off um, some of these layers, metal three, metal four, um, metal two, yeah. So metal one is used for uh, routing plus and minus, and then the cells get put on this regular grid, so they get power along the top and the bottom, and then every other row they get flipped, so they kind of they can work both way rounds. So if this inverter was up here, it would have been flipped over on the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's still not wired up. But it's got power now, mm -hmm. it's in the right place, and the last step is to kind of join the Connect input, input and the output, output port and, and the, join it together. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So then if I do make K layout uh, final, we'll see the whole design now. And it um, quite a lot of stuff has changed. So not only do we have this um, input wire coming in and then joining up to the uh, inverter, We've also got all the layers now, so we can see um, like the, the, the P and the N doping. We've also got um, these uh, capacitors. So all the, all the space that's not used by your cells gets turned into capacitors, basically. Oh, I didn't know so that. So inside here, we can see all the cells that are used. Mm -hmm. So we've got um, a bunch of decoupling capacitors, so I can turn those all off. Mm -hmm. So now it's a lot easier to see. Oh, there is input. Um, back. I, I, it was my question, yeah. what is on the input and what is on the output? Yes, this is one of the differences between um, the first version of the tools that I used for my first tape out and the current cutting edge of the tools is that they're buffering the inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't the case um, in the previous version, but now that seems to be uh, happening all the time by default. So that's buffer one. That's the one of the buffers. Yeah, we we've got a buffer and we've got that's we've got a buffer for ah, okay. the input and we've got a clock buffer being used for the output, probably to drive it a bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got tap cells, which uh, is like an important part of making all the MOSFETs work. And I've got filler cells. And then the final thing that I've got left is my inverter. Mm -hmm. Wow! So that all that all that stuff happens automatically from my original um, uh, couple of lines of the code. Yeah. So that this was this went in, and then I had the config file that told um, Open Lane. Um, like where to find the source and that there wasn't a clock because this is this is a bit of an abnormal design because it 
for digital design because it doesn't have a clock. Okay, so let, let's so have a look again on the silicon. So it, this is uh, the kind of standard uh, inverter. It's something mm -hmm. what uh, what uh, they know they can manufacture and it will work. Uh, how it mm -hmm. is built? What is inside of the inverter? What's inside yeah. the inverter? So what we can see here. Yeah, so um, let's turn off some things that we don't need. Okay, so the, at the moment, the metal one layer is just used for connecting mm -hmm. the input and the output and, the and for providing power mm -hmm. and ground. Yeah, so I can turn that off. Um, and then we've got these layers here. So um, let's just take a look at uh, how an inverter works. So for a CMOS inverter, we've got a PMOS and an NMOS, and they're connected together. So the inputs, the gates are both connected, and then the outputs are connected. So if this goes high, it turns off this and it turns on this. So this gets pulled low, so it inverts. Whereas if this goes low, it turns on the P, so it pulls that up. So for us to make an inverter, we need to have a P on the top and an N on the bottom. Um, and we want to join the two gates and we want to uh, join the two outputs and we want to connect one side to plus and one side to mm. ground. So down here, this is actually a two, um, a double drive inverter. So it's uh, with, in the standard cells, actually maybe I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go back to my book ASIC um, presentation tools, make sky, make show sky all. This is all the standard cells that we have mm -hmm. in the in the high density library. Can you design your own cell? Yeah, you can do. Yeah. And then use it in your design. Not, yeah. Yeah, I have not done that, but um, there have been people that have done that. Um, but it's very nice that we have all the standard cells, so we don't have to do that. Yeah. That's one of the cool things about the PDK. So if I set this to the new top, so what we saw before was um, a double drive inverter so it could drive twice as strong and now i'm just looking at a single drive mm -hmm. inverter so this is basically so a library got... we can call it library yeah yes it, yeah absolutely so this is the um like you're saying this is the library from the library and we've got our input a and our output y so a is connecting to the two gates and we've got this polysilicon layer here so this is um poly drawing that goes down to this N channel and up to this P channel. And then um, the N channel is made by, um, uh, let's turn off some more layers. So this this is um, showing where the diffusion is happening for the N and P types. And then whether it's an N or a P is whether we've got this one, that's for, um, I don't know why that's saying N well. Maybe it's upside down or it's mislabeled, but the P late, because um, these are constructed on P substrate mm -hmm. um, for an N channel MOSFET, which is what we've got at the bottom. We put a P, we dope it P. Um, no, that's not right. It's P channel substrate. So to get an N channel MOSFET, we dope it N. So we've got some N dopant here um, and then the gate goes over the top of it. And then when we get a voltage on the gate, it allows the current to flow um, from to the, the drain in the source, um, nice. and the and we've got this connected to ground here, and then this connects up. So this is local interconnect here. What well, I'm turning on and off there, and that connects the output of this MOSFET and the output of this MOSFET, and then the input of this one is connected up to power, and then we've got the other gate here. So yeah, I'm a bit, um, I'm more used to demonstrating this with magic. Um, so the LE layer, it's like a conductive layer internet. or what is it? It's a, yes, it's a conductive layer. Um, it's kind of, it's fairly high resistance. So you don't want to use it for long mm -hmm. traces, but it's used extensively in the standard cells for connecting things mm -hmm. so that you don't have to use metal one, mm -hmm. so that you can instead use metal one to make connections between cells. Mm -hmm. And you use this yeah. LE basically, for example, to connect the uh, elements which are close to each other or... 
Yeah. Our reach. Yeah. So we've got yeah. yeah. Okay. We've got the the local interconnect is doing um, the job of connecting to the uh, P and the N doped material, and then the poly is the gate. Um, so and then can we see like, the yeah. uh, P and uh, N material because so that's what you are. Yeah, I don't know to... why okay. this is. Um, I'm going to show you with. Um, uh, Do they need to like calculate the size of the um, areas or? Yeah, definitely. And the the size of the area and the width of the gate de like determines the performance of the mm -hmm. MOSFET. So um, you will get things like a faster or a slower or a stronger or a weaker MOSFET depending on how big things are. So yeah, I'm I'm more used to using magic to demonstrate this, and you can see like the two different colors here. So the green is this end diffusion layer. Mm -hmm. um, so I can turn that on on and off like this, and then the N is um, sorry, the P is this layer here. Mm -hmm. So that's the diffusion layers, and yeah. that's where all the magic is happening. Yes, and because we're on a P substrate, um, we have to in, uh, we can't just put a P um, diffusion down on top of that. We have to insulate it from the P substrate. So that's what this block here is. So that's um, I don't, it's going to take me a while to find it now. N N well, there we go. So it's like um, adding an extra insulation layer of N type so that we can build a P type. MOSFET on top of it. You know, this is so. kind of reminding me the time at university where we yeah where yeah we had me too. This like <laughs> went totally over my head when I studied this at university. Yeah, so this is like the cross section. So we've got the the polysilicon insulated with an oxide layer on top of the P type. Okay, so the polysilicon uh, is the conductive part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there are and small then, parts of uh, N. Uh, well, so yeah, so this is all P-type. Okay. And so to make an N-type MOSFET, we have um, we dope this okay. uh, with say arsenic ions, and that turns it into an N-type material. Mm. And then when we charge up the gate, it allows um, current to flow from one side to the other. I'm going to interrupt uh, the call because if you are not sure how MOSFET works, then just search on internet. It's not very difficult to understand how this works. I found this article, so you can read something here. Or if you prefer a video, this is a very nice video, so you can watch it here. Okay, let's go back to our call. So we've got like a, and if I turn off local interconnect as well, there we go. We've got like an area of P type here mm -hmm. and P type here, but underneath here is, is the gap where there isn't any. And on top, we've got the polysilicon that can charge it up on sitting on top of an oxide layer. Okay. And then when that gets charged up, it changes the electrochemical properties here and allows current to flow between the two ah, n-type dopes. So, so they can cross regions. the gap. Yep. So this distance here, this L, is super important. And for the Skywater 130 nanometer process, that gate width is 150 nanometers. So this distance from um, from here to here is 150 nanometers. Yeah. Who is designing this? <laughs> <laughs> a long chain of people going back 50 years. So that's why it's like standing on top of the shoulders or standing on top of the shoulders or standing on top of the shoulders. So yes. So um, yes, it's incredible and like the amount of work and research that has been done that allows us to kind of so accurately control these processes and create these things is just absolutely mind-blowing to me. Okay, let's go back to our design. So uh, how do we continue? 
we can see um, we can see the um our inverter is connected yeah so um make k layout final this is where we got up to so we ended up with this little block and kind of in the biz this is called a macro because it we've kind of we've hardened this into a little block and now that block we could give to somebody else and they could put it in their design so um now what we would do is we would copy that file into the correct place in the caravel repository and then we would say we'd run a make command that would join everything together and then we would end up with um instead of uh, like my example here where i had all of these things in here we would just get this huge empty space with just that tiny little block in the middle mm -hmm. and then one pin connected over here and one pin connected over there so you can and specify that... where exactly you would like to connect the input and output on what yeah. pin here yeah because when we um when we put part of the process of putting the that design into Caravel is mm -hmm. putting the GDS files that we've just been looking at, the, the like the layout files, um, but also we have to kind of make the connections in the harder description language. So we take Caravel and then um, we take the bit that says where our inverter macro should be and then write a bit of harder description language that says connect the input to this pin and connect the output to that pin and then when we run the uh, the tools to build the final submission files for caravel then it makes those um, connections for us to make sure that the whatever macro that we've put there gets wired up correctly okay and uh, the pins which are around uh, mm -hmm. these are just the pins which will go outside of the chip yeah, well, some of them are for power and some of them are for like special for clock, things like this. Um, uh, GPIO, we've got a serial port. We've got mm -hmm. um, uh, QSPI well, Some of them flash. are already used. Some of them are already used. And then we have 38 uh, GPIOs for ah, uh, just so for So Mega us. Project Area, that's the area where you place your own design. That's, yeah, that's where our blocks go. So our inverter goes in there. And then we connect one IO pad to the in and one IO pad to the out. Mm. Send that to eFabulous, get in the lottery, goes to Skywater, they send us back our chip, and we've got the most complicated inverter ever made. <laughs> <laughs> and if you like, you can basically connect also the microcontroller to your inverter, correct? Yeah, so that's so we've got a logic analyzer here. So that's useful for kind of checking that your design is working or for doing like configuration. So um for example, uh the WS2812 driver. So you know the little programmable LEDs that have like a single data line to change the colors? And they're called WS2812s. Have you heard of those? No. Okay, they they're like quite popular in the maker community. Uh Adafruit have a special name for them, I think, NeoPixel maybe. Anyway, that you like, they have a kind of a special um, serial interface for telling them what color to be. So I made a driver for that, which is um, module five. And then the input port of that is connected to the microcontroller. Mm -hmm. So I write a bit of firmware that says, make the first LED red, the second LED green, the third LED blue, and then that C program sends some information to my block here and then that block is responsible for just sending out that serial data really quickly and reliably out of one of the IO ports mm -hmm. um, or for example uh, the seven segment counter has got like an, an update port where you can tell it what the clock frequency is because if it's got like a 16 megahertz clock but it's counting up to 12 million then it's going to count fast or slow. So you can then, depending on the clock frequency, you can t edit some firmware and change that clock divider so that it's uh, accurate to the second. Or like um, one of the people that I sp interviewed recently about a amateur satellite transceiver, he uses some firmware to configure the divider for a PLL for a voltage-controlled oscillator. So you can 
it's useful to have like a little bit of uh, a, a MCU on board so that you yeah, can configure your designs that. or get it, information back from the designs. It's easier to talk to the chip. It's kind of, you can use it as a kind of debugger and you can also use it to control the thing what you design. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and because a lot of people are interested in RISC-V at the moment, and we have this uh, wishbone bus here, a lot of people are kind of making a custom peripheral, like a crypto um, accelerator mm -hmm. or a little bit of programmable logic or um, a, a divider or a floating point accelerator, and then you connect it up with a standard wishbone bus, and then you can write firmware that, gets, that can use the acceleration. So why custom peripheral? Why people would like to use this rather than FPGA? Good question. I mean, for me, it's because I'm interested and I want to learn how to do it. And I've been using other people's microcontrollers for, you know, 20 years or whatever, um, and never kind of thought that I would understand at this low level. And for me, I learn by doing like I understand by experimentation and trying. So by kind of going through this process myself, I've kind of learned a lot of cool stuff along the way. Um, some of it useful probably for working with microcontrollers, some of it not. Um, but um, the, like, the real reasons for using an ASIC over an FPGA is probably mostly to do with volume. Like once you're making 100,000 of something, it's going to be cheaper to have a custom chip made than buy 100,000 FPGAs. Also, you can um, keep your secret. Keep your secret, although that's not the point of, um, of this whole um, effort, which is all about open source stuff. And ah. In fact, one of the rules of being able to get the free shuttle but is that I your mean, design if you has pay, to be... If you pay for this, like you design oh, yeah, something, if you pay for this, yeah. what uh, yeah. is going to cost you 10,000, but it's going to yeah. keep your secret, which is worth millions, then... Yeah, yeah. Although I'm sure someone could um, uh, reverse engineer it if they got hold of a sample, you know. There's lots of people out there on the internet who dissolve chips with nitric acid and then take photos and then recon like Ken Sheriff does a lot of reverse engineering of old uh, microchips. So it'd probably be quite hard to keep a secret from him, I imagine. Uh, okay. So at least it's interesting to, to try it. And maybe someone who would like to get into designing chips, this could be, this could be like one of the ways how they can Yeah, I think start, that's maybe. one of the most interesting things about this whole um, project or this initiative is lowering the um, the kind of barrier to entry because if you have to sign an NDA to get the PDK and then that means you can't share stuff and other people can't share it with you and then if the tools like the traditional industry standard tools are tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for a license then it's very expensive to get in and then after you've got a design it costs a lot of money to actually get it produced it's very difficult so all those barriers have been taken away and now it's really much more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, when um, Tim Ansell um, uh, announced the Google-sponsored ASIC shuttle, this was uh, on, well, I put four of his slides together here to make one. And like some of the philosophy that he was explaining was that um, wanting to be able to people to share, wanting people to try like things that are maybe risky that they wouldn't want to take the risk of paying for mm -hmm. themselves um, to get more people involved. Um, yeah, anyone, anyone involved, commercial startups, makers, hobbyists, anybody. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's about kind of, this initiative is about breaking down barriers and making it easier for people to do this for the first time. And learn. Yeah, and that's that's what I've done. Like I've learned how to do it and made my first tape out last year. So I'm still waiting to get that back. So fingers crossed, at least uh, some of these designs will actually work. <laughs> nice. What else you have on these uh, slides? Um, that we've not looked at. Oh yeah, you created um, this presentation for uh, some special event or? For a conference called Embo. Um, 
uh, like an embedded C conference. Mm -hmm. And the first version was for Hackaday Remoticon. Um, this is quite a cool slide. This came from Mohammed Kasim's uh, presentation from the uh, Fosse dial-up series, which is like a, a YouTube series of um, uh, dial-ups where someone does a presentation. And he did a presentation on what the results were of the first tape out. So we had all of these designs submitted. Um, and this is a, like a nice picture to kind of see the, the various things that we've got. So we've got like super regular stuff and then like these really blobby ones and then very simple ones and ones that look almost empty. So you see this kind of wide range of like the look of the design. You can kind of tell a little bit about the design just, just from the look. Like these ones that are mostly empty uh, analog ones where mm -hmm. someone has like drawn a very small specific bit of something they want to test like a VCO. They just wired that one little bit in and then the rest is empty. Um, these super regular ones are open source FPGA designs. These two here. Um, so there are just really... uh, some kind of cells and then uh, you through the microcontroller, you can configure how they are going to be connected and how they are going to work together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in the red uh, rectangle, that's your design. That's my one. And then the pink rectangles are ones um, done by people that I've interviewed for my YouTube channel. So I know a little bit more about those ones. Why some of them are so uh, unusually shaped? Yeah. What, like these blobby yeah. ones? Yes. Um, so that's like huge digital designs uh, just dropped into open lane. And then the way that it does the layout looks like that. <laughs> and then the more kind of um, the more um, regular ones are the ones where people are controlling the process more tightly. So this one is like a collection of kind of 10 or 15 small macros all joined together, mm -hmm. a bit like mine. Mm -hmm. uh, the super regular ones are FPGAs where someone has designed an FPGA logic cell and then tiled them exactly. Okay. Yeah. How do you access um, these um, designs which are on the chip? So how do you kind of debug this board? Uh, do you have also something about that? I, I've seen you connect it to USB or? Yeah, so... Um, you connect the big board, you get the big... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, it will have a USB socket on it um, and a serial to UART converter. Mm -hmm. And then that UART converter will um, connect into here mm -hmm. and you'll be able to program the flash and then control the reset. Uh, and there is, and I so guess there be... is uh, uh, some kind of uh, software what do you use together with the board? Um, that's a good a good point. Um, I've not really thought about that yet. Um, <laughs> the I've run uh, simulations of this, and so I have the tool chain. So I can show you I can show you a bit about what that looks like. Um, so if I go to shuttle one, um, Caravel release. So seven segment counter is kind of that very simple design. I've not we've not really looked at it much, but it's a it's just this um, counts up to ten every increments every second and shows the number on a seven segment mm -hmm. display. And so I've got a C file, mm -hmm. um, and that sets up the GPIO. So just like a microcontroller where you're setting things like high, low, mm -hmm. like what drive strength, the SLU, this kind of stuff, pull up resistors. Um, we set up the out the pins to be outputs, say the, the GPIO outputs, apply that configuration, um, wait for a bit, and then what I'm doing is kind of setting the clock divider so it's going to count up on the correct clock frequency. So this is the software for the microcontroller. That's yeah, that's the firmware, and then this is the make file for the firmware, and mm -hmm. it's using the RISC-V toolchain GCC to compile the firmware um, and uh, do the linking so that I end up with a binary. Um, 
and then that binary I'll need to copy that into the um the flash mm -hmm. I'll do um, copy so the I, flash um there was there's a ton of um flash programming tools I'm going to interrupt this call we are almost finished uh, I was just curious what else Matt has uh, in his presentation and um, there were some slides about uh, which were talking a little bit more about how chips are manufactured so that's what Matt is going to explain next here it is uh, look through here and come up with a few other ones oh show the uh, the structure it was a nice picture what you show yeah uh, the this one uh this about, one. yeah yeah okay yeah so maybe i'll just talk through these uh three individually okay so um so in relation to how what actually goes on in the factory which is also really interesting like how you once you've got those gds files there's 33 layers how they get turned into the actual functioning microchip um i really recommend this talk by sam zalouf and he's an incredible young guy who's built a chip factory in his garage and he's got he made a, a presentation for hackaday supergon and um it's a it's a bit like the way that pcbs are made where it's like photo lithography process where you you take in this case a silicon wafer this p p dope substrate you coat it with photoresist you put a mask on top so that's one of our 33 layers you um bake it you um you shine light on it ultraviolet light through a mask that's got patterns of squares so all these all these polygons that we've seen in magic or k layout each of those relate to a different um square you can kind of see a little bit here mm -hmm. the, the squares being developed um then you develop it and you um wash it off and then you've basically got little holes left and the rest of the uh, silicon is protected by the photoresist and then through those holes you do something like implant nlp ions or etch away or put down a metal to make a conductive trace or put down a different material to build up these different structures that we need and then you basically repeat that process over and over again until you've built up but with the same silicon you don't you don't uh, the silicon is the base yeah the sil you have a, like a p doped silicon substrate base and then you build up on top of that mm -hmm. over and over again until you get like these three-dimensional structures of the so this is like a side 3d view of that inverter we looked at earlier mm -hmm. where we've got the um the n and the p channel on the polysilicon and the the connections to metal one i think i've got this upside down actually yeah i'd have to imagine this one can i turn this upside down easily yes so we've got the the n and the the p doping the polysilicon and the local interconnect and then metal one and it's all up going up in layers so we get these three-dimensional shapes and then they, then it's all stacked up together with it with the metal layers used to interconnect so the kind of the magic happens down here or, or with the mosfets mm -hmm. and then everything is um connected on metal one two three four and five on skywater 130 we've got five metal layers and this particular process from this picture that i found on twitter has got six metal layers i would like to ask uh it's what is very interesting all the lines are straight just horizontal and vertical so that's like always the chips are designed this way there are no like uh, you know 45 degrees uh, lines or 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 mix up yeah I th with, uh, if, if you if you look at um if you look at uh, analog stuff then everything looks ah, totally different okay. because people are drawing and designing things by hand mm -hmm. and you're laying things out and because this is sensitive analog and it's an oscillator and you want everything to be the same it's all symmetrical so, so, so there is no are, reason why there should be only horizontal and no, vertical lines no, it's only because the, the software do it exactly way. so if you 
you've got all these it's basically because it's an auto router mm -hmm. so and the auto router you can just say um they get good results if you just kind of say first layer metal one do it all horizontally so that it's connecting up inside um inside the um within the standard cells mm -hmm. then metal two is vertical across standard cells then metal three horizontal then metal four vertical metal five horizontal and then all connected together with vias and so you can get a lot of connectivity it's like having a four layer circuit board mm -hmm. right on top of your hundred thousand components do you know what is the isolation layer between these uh, metal layers uh, there isn't an isolation layer you just have to make sure that um, they're not touching each other but there so needs you can easily to be get short circuits no, between them Oh, I see what you mean. Um, I no, that's a good question. Maybe it's just um, uh, an oxide layer. Let's mm -hmm. see if the stack up has a name, uh, an information on that. Um, ah, okay. So this is the stack up. Oh, nice. Yeah. So this is the, this is the Skywalker stack up. Um, it's not to scale it's a much flatter than this and i was just looking to see yeah what is this in between here we've got a distance but uh, i can uh, now we can very nicely see the p substrate that's the silicon and uh, the there, there is the hole mm -hmm. which we did in the slides before which mm -hmm. is filled up with something and then we build all the other layers on top of it yeah yeah but that's a good question i don't know what the isolation is Maybe silicon uh, dioxide, because that's the oxide layer that is used to insulate the gate from... Um, so, uh, where is that picture of the MOSFET again? So this layer here that insulates the mm -hmm. metal from the substrate mm -hmm. is silicon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So to, And to get that, all you need is like the clean silicon wafer, and you bake it, raise the temperature, and it generates this insulating layer of silicon dioxide mm -hmm. so yeah i wouldn't be surprised um if it was just um silicon dioxide in between all these layers how they but do I the vias know. uh exactly the like this this process that um uh, we saw so you create a mask that has the holes where you want the vias you do the development you etch a hole through then you bombard it uh, you like um, sputter metal onto it to build up a metal layer and then you've got like a little a metal hole so the vias they um, may have any kind of shape theoretically they don't need to be round yeah yeah no no and they're, they're almost always square actually the only ones i've ever seen are square so f we've got these uh, metal layers here and each l layer has its own via layer as well mm -hmm. so you have like a shape for the connection and then another shape for the via mm -hmm. ah, okay so yeah. the the via is basically only between the metal layers mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah okay what else do you have here there's maybe like a couple of other things to just talk about one one is um uh the timeline mm -hmm. so we had that like the first tape out mm -hmm. Um, kind of end of November, then it kind of stretched into a bit December, and then there were some problems discovered in early January um, that we had to fix, and that's kind of delayed uh, the plan for um, multi-project wafer two mm -hmm. to the middle of 2021, and then they're so planning this is the another one. So the second time for when, uh, when uh, these uh, the, chips can be manufactured, the free Google Shuttle, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then my own kind of project is like working out how to not waste silicon. So like for me, I don't have like huge designs. Mm -hmm. My designs here what at like design one, five and eight. So one, five and eight. So they're all quite small. So I would have felt bad like taking up a whole slot on my own. So I... Um, came up with a way of kind of multiplexing a bunch of diff people's different designs. So this block here, nine, the big one, mm -hmm. is a multiplex. So all these designs connect to nine and then go out to the IOs. And then we have a bit of firmware that switches which design is active. This is the kind of schematic here. Um, and now I'm doing this a bit more. Now I've learned more. 
I'm doing this with um, more projects um, and the projects can be a bit bigger and then I'm isolating the projects by having tri-state outputs. So I'm kind of working on some open source tools where you put in some projects, you run the tools and it generates the configuration file for open lane and then you run open lane and it gets things ready for making the submission. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm using with my course. So at the end of the course, when everyone's finished, we take all the designs joint. So this is like a way of automating that so that I don't make a mistake and end up doing something silly and breaking the whole chip. <laughs> nice. So if uh, someone would like to maybe design their own chip, what they should mm -hmm. do? Should they like contact you somewhere or uh, should they like take your course or what? Yeah, so um, uh, obviously I would say um, you should take my course. So that's like, um, so it's zero to ASIC. So it's kind of assuming a low level of initial knowledge um, and it covers like MOSFETs and the PDK, digital design, a bit of verification, simulation, Caravel and how to make a submission. Um, mostly flipped classroom so you do it on your own time and then there's like office hours with me if you get stuck mm -hmm. and then at the end we take everyone's design and uh, submit them as a group um so that's like um um that's one way of doing it but is there's quite there's growing amounts of documentation and um we're all kind of learning and sharing knowledge so um um what I, i've got like a resources page on my mm -hmm. website so another thing is like there's a lot of terminology so i put together a terminology page on my website mm -hmm. for all this all these kind of words that we're using like a definition for those i would definitely recommend um whether you are interested in doing a course or not that you watch some of the fossey dial-up talks because that kind of introduces it um introduces the project um, and then if you want to get involved, you should join the, um, the Google Skywater Slack channel. That's where everyone hangs out. And then we've got uh, Open Lane and its documentation. So you can read about the ASIC flow on the uh, Read the Docs site. So that's like Lane documentation and process. Commands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you'd need to also learn about um, Caravel and how to make the submission. Um, but that's one of the um, videos that's covered in... Um, actually, I'm not sure if, where that video is. I can put that video up, though. Um, but Ahmed Ghazi made a video on how you like the steps that you go through to uh, finalize your design and then upload it to the eFabulous website. Mm -hmm. And then eFabulous have videos on how to finish and make your own submission. So, yeah, you can definitely do it on your own. Um, there's a guy called Kunal as well, Kunal Gosh, who also um, has been doing some courses. He does uh, like he does courses like covering every part of VLSI. He's got like 50 courses. Um, a lot of them are on Udemy, and this one I've found recently. Um, Grant Brown has put this together, which is like meant to be a five-day uh, training course on Open Lane. It's got quite a lot of. I've looked through it. I think you would probably need support. It would probably need to be facilitated by somebody, but there's a lot of good information there. Um, but yeah, the the thing to do would be to like get started by like maybe an FPGA dev board, start playing with a digital design, um, and then like download the open lane tools, try and get your digital design uh, hardened into the GDS files, and then look at Caravel and then finally submitting it to eFabulous. That's the kind because of process. Your course basically helps people to start quickly so they don't have to go through all the reading and, uh, and uh, yes, yeah. bring out. Yeah, I just um, finished the first round and done like a feedback session with people. And that's one of the things that people have said. It's like an accelerator. Yeah, so that's what it I mean. saves someone six months time and they do it in just six weeks. So and I think everyone will ask how much it costs. Yeah. So the um, the standard ticket is $500. So that's like all the course content and then one hour of office hours with me. And then like the pro ticket for people who really want to just get through it as quickly as possible. They don't want to 
um, be stuck anywhere is $800. And that's just the same thing. But instead of one hour office hours, it's four hours office hours with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you can, um, the way, so I've already sold out the um, April courses. But if you're interested in that, then the way to uh, express your interest is sign up to the mailing list. And then that's where I release the new tickets. So the next tickets are going to be in probably June. Nice. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. Did we miss something? I think we went through I most of the... I think we've probably got through. I mean, I've got like... I mean, one thing really to make so clear is I've had so much help from a lot of very patient and generous people. And I've put their names, some of their names down here. Mm -hmm. And I have found it to be a very helpful community and my own kind of zero to ASIC journey. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I really hope you found it useful. I found it like super interesting. And uh, I would like to thank you very much to Matt for uh, finding time to have this call and helping me to create this video. And if you have any questions, what you would like to ask Matt, leave them under this video. Okay. Also, if you have any feedback, uh, what uh, what you would like to tell me, maybe if you if you like this video or maybe what kind of videos we could make in future, what kind of uh, people I should contact, leave your comments and ideas under this video. Uh, if you like this video, don't forget press like button. If you would like to see my future videos, Again, you know exactly what to do. Subscribe. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.